Hey everybody, this is Ben dropping you a quick note. Our editors have been working hard to get episodes finished to release on schedule with the reading of the week. Our hope is that listeners will have the chance to engage with the content and share meaningful ideas in their circles of family, friends, and church. In order to meet this goal, this episode has been released with minimal editing. We are looking for additional volunteers to join the team and help with editing, social media management, and content creation. If you are interested, please reach out to us on Facebook or email latterdaypeacestudies at gmail.com. You can also donate to the project, helping us cover the costs of things like website hosting and podcast platform fees. Donations can be made through PayPal by going to our website, latterdaypeacestudies.org, clicking Get Involved, and scrolling down to the donate box. Thanks so much to all who have helped out and donated over the years. We are sincerely grateful. Latter-day Peace Studies is produced by peace-loving members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any views expressed herein are not to be taken as official positions of the Church or its authorities. Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm Christopher Hurtado. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's reading of Come Follow Me as outlined by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our hope is that as we discuss the scriptures, we will come to a more perfect understanding through experiencing the atonement of Jesus Christ and find greater peace in our lives. Welcome back to Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm your co-host, Ben Peterson. And I'm your co-host, Christopher Hurtado. Today, Christopher, we're going to be discussing 1 Corinthians. We're going to do a little bit of intro to this book. Now, we have been discussing Romans for the past two weeks. And we talked about how these epistles are organized in the New Testament. They're mostly organized from longest to shortest. And so this isn't a chronological thing that we're going through here. Romans is one of the later things that Paul writes. Maybe the latest. Yeah, one of the latest. But 1 Corinthians is kind of, you know, somewhere around in the middle of what he's writing. So it just happens to be the second longest. And so that's why it's second. (laughs) All right. So 1 Corinthians is written by Paul. This is basically unanimously agreed upon by scholars that this is authentically Paul. This is written to the community of believers in Christ in the city of Corinth, the Greek city of Corinth. Ben, there's just one, one caveat to that though, right? And that's that part of it is not believed to be Paul's, right? So the the epistle is authentically considered as Paul's, right? With the exception of 1433b through 35 or 36, right? Yeah, because, there might be some interpolations there, yeah. Right, silencing of women in the assemblies, right? That contradicts 11.5 because in 11.5, Paul's approvingly talking about women praying and prophesying. And then, of course, the later pastoral epistles uh, advocate women's sub- subordination, and they're not Paul's, right? First Timothy mm-hmm. two eleven through twelve, Titus two five. So it looks like somebody, maybe those same authors or that same author, or someone influenced by that author or those authors, inserted something here in First Corinthians. Uh, yeah, it certainly could be, or, or seems like that. Now, I would certainly allow for Paul have changing his mind over time, right? But if we look at Romans. We can definitely see that, at least by that time, that is definitely not Paul's opinion because he sends the whole letter by way of Phoebe, and Phoebe is the one who reads it. So if Paul is thinking that women shouldn't speak in church, he writes his longest letter and sends it by a woman. So (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So, you know, that's, that's pretty good evidence there that that is not Paul's view, at least by the time of Romans. So. So we, uh, you know, on Corinth, this, this Greek city, it was a very important commercial, cultural, political center in the ancient world, even at this time, Paul's focus on the city of Corinth does something to indicate that his missionary or proselytizing goals were pretty lofty, right? So I think he's thinking if he could succeed here in Corinth, that the message of Christ that he's spreading would have a pretty good foothold in the Greco-Roman world. So if you can make it in Corinth, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, something like that. It's like or this is a good hub, right? Like this is a good place where you can then sort of branch out to other places because it's a a hub of commerce and culture and politics. Right. Now the letter addresses a bunch of different issues that 
are particular to the church in Corinth. And there is some indication here that he does speak generally, but again, these are situational. Most of these epistles are are situation. They're speaking to particular circumstances and situations within the churches. So Paul addresses sexual immorality. He addresses association with non-believers or apostates. He addresses pagan practices, and he talks about marriage and you know other things throughout this letter. I just have one comment about that, Ben, and that is that we, we, you said churches. I love that you said churches, not church, right? That's what we're looking at. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I wanted to point out that church is translating ecclesia, which means gathering, right? Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a gathering. Yeah, it's easier assembly. to see yeah. an assembly, yeah, an assembly of believers. You know, it's a grouping of the believers. Ecclesia is uh, easy to see as um, related to iglesia. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure where church comes from. That's different. I think we've talked about that before. Yeah, that you know gets into some linguistic history. So. <laughs> yeah, so iglesia is the Spanish. That sounds a lot like the Greek ecclesia. Yeah. So 1 Corinthians is commonly talked about as a single letter, but there are a number of scholars that think it could be made up of multiple letters. So the flow of the text isn't always smooth. Some scholars think that there could be as many as three different letters going on here and identify different pieces of them and maybe even stitch together at different points. That becomes a little bit of an issue as, as we found in our study, right? It actually matters to us. We wish we knew, right, Ben? I think we'd be able to make better sense of this letter if we knew if it really were one letter. I think that'll show up in the discussion. Right. And some of that is because when you get to some of the verses that we're talking about, you say, okay, well, why is he addressing this here? And, you know, you want to go a few verses back and say, oh, this is the context of this. But if if that was actually part of a different letter, then Paul is thinking about something different in those verses before than he is in those. And so the verses previous may not provide the context you think they're providing, right? Yeah. So that's something to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. So there are other scholars who think that it may just be evidence or, or the, you know, the not the smooth transitions here might just be evidence that the letter wasn't written all at once, but maybe over an extended period of time. So like, you know, Paul sets to to write or dictate the letter and then comes back to it at a later time and kind of gets sort of on a tangential top, topic, but isn't sticking specifically to what he was talking about before. Maybe he's been thinking about other things in the meantime. So that's a possible explanation for how it could be, be, be one, all one letter that was sent at once, but maybe pieces of it were dictated at different times. Yeah, I can see that. Especially if you didn't have your... your um transcriptionist read back to you what you dictated previously as is yeah <laughs> as we as is done right that's the best practice right right uh, one of the things i was thinking about as reading through this as remembering nt wright's commentary on corinthians in in his biography of paul and he kind of paints a picture of paul first arriving in corinth after having undergone persecutions and trials in other cities you know there's a point in in these chapters we're getting into where he says, I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. And so N.T. Wright kind of paints this, this story of Paul and his travels as when he comes to Corinth, he, he went through a lot, he had gone through a lot of things before he finds some people there that help him. And then he's able to build a community over time uh, there among the people as he does in other places. Yeah, I can't read Fear and Trembling without thinking of Kierkegaard's book by that title, oh, right? Yeah. And that brings me back to the the Binding of Isaac, right? Yeah, that's interesting. So one thing that I want us to keep in mind, Ben, as we go through this is we are anticipating, right, in the context of this letter and all these letters, we're anticipating the near arrival of the Messianic kingdom, right? Mm-hmm. That the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is going to come back any day. And I think that's important context for this letter. That and another issue is Paul seems to be concerned a lot with justification. Justification is probably best understood as being in a right relationship with God. And of course, you would want to be in a right relationship with God if the messianic kingdom is impending. Yeah. And to that point, you know, he starts off here in chapter one with the the standard formula of the epistle. But 
when we get to verse seven, he says something to that effect, as you were talking about, you know, the, the impending coming of Jesus Christ. So he says, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the expectation here is that Jesus is coming back very soon. So we're not talking about decades or at this point millennia, right? <laughs> we're talking about months or maybe years, but not super far away. Yeah, that's that's the context. Yeah. And we saw, Pete, we, we talked about this last time, maybe last time, uh, maybe when we introduced all the letters, right? The idea that Paul himself changes his views as he gets older and Jesus hasn't mm-hmm. come back, right? Yeah, there is a sense in which Paul's like, oh, uh, I kind of thought Jesus would be here by now. He's not. And so, you know, I'm thinking about things a little bit differently. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think we can see that by the time he gets to Romans. Yeah. In verses 12 and 13, there's some play on words going on here that brings in sort of some political views or not Paul's political views, but he he brings in sort of a political mindset to it because he talks about parties and parts and being divided, right? So this kind of has to do maybe with partisanship as compared or as contrasted to a unity in Christ. So he says, has Christ been divided? So that would be the English mm. word divided there. But if if we were to try to get to more like a literal translation, parted, right? Has has Christ been broken into to pieces, to parties? And and sort of the play on words here or the the allusion is to political parties, right? Because uh there were these different types of of partisan groups and then the people get branded as Christian, which um, it has the suffix, at least within the English language, of being a, a partisan, like a political party, right? And so this was maybe a derogatory term, but then the people went ahead and took it as, oh yeah, sure, we're Christian, right? <laughs> well, and there are other parties being referred to here among Christians, right? You have people, he's saying, I think he's talking about Christians when he says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, if we go on social media today, we find that it does seem that Christians do believe that that that, that there are these parties, right? Yeah. <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Verse 14 was a little funny to me. You know, he says, I, you know, I thank God that I baptized none of you except, and then he goes on to list several people. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny that you know, I baptize none of you except this person and this person. Oh yeah. And then this whole family of people. (laughs) Why do you think that's important though, Ben? I saw, here's my answer. It looks like he's saying, okay, yeah, I baptize you, but don't get the wrong idea. It's not, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Yeah. I mean, some of the commentary indicated that the first two that he lists in that list might've been, people that were uh, instigating some of this partisanship, so to speak. And that's why he mentions them and then later mentions a different one. I didn't quite see that. I just, again, it, it seemed humorous to me for, for him to be saying except. But yes, I think the rhetorical point here is that it doesn't matter who baptized you. And I'm glad I didn't baptize very many of you. You know, it was just a few, a few of you because I don't want you you know, claiming that me baptizing you somehow makes you part of my religion. You're you're part of Christ. You're not part of me. Yeah. So in verse 17, Ben, we have Paul talking about the cross so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The cross sounds pretty important here, Ben. And, you know, it might be surprising to Latter-day Saints to learn that the cross was very much part a part of Latter-day Saintism until around the time of David O. McKay, and that even then, it didn't disappear from Latter-day Saintism from the top down, but rather from a grassroots movement. It was very much a part of Latter-day Saintism, and I, I don't think that's well known. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems justified. It's really important. The cross is really, really important in Paul. There's a lot to say about, you know, his views here and how he's expressing this in terms of the symbolism of the cross. The first thing that occurred to me was that 
you know, earlier in the verses, he's talking about these different parties and part of this or part of that. And for him to bring up the cross and kind of condense the whole message of Jesus into this single symbol is almost like a, like a political slogan, right? Like, you know, cross type of thing, trying to condense the message into one type of statement. Um, But one of the things that's interesting about that is that the cross itself is seen culturally, like deeply culturally, as scandalous. So the assertion that people should listen to someone who was crucified is what we might call beyond the pale. Yeah. (laughs) The the Greek word that's used, uh, moria, is translated as foolishness. But it has a social connotation that does not make it through in the translation. It might more aptly be translated as a vulgar joke. In other Mm. words, the cross is a vulgar joke. Yeah, but this is no joke, right? This is we're talking Mm -hmm. about as much as it seems counter to the culture. This is the victory of of Christ. It's not like the victory that, that Rome has that that Rome thinks it's going to bring peace to the world through, through victory, uh, through conquering everyone, right? Rather, the victory of the cross is the victory of, of death, right? It's, it's so counterintuitive, right? You're going yes. to win by dying. The Romans are going to win by killing. Jesus is going to win by dying. It seems like a joke, right? I get it. Yeah, it's supposed to be counterintuitive. It's supposed to be paradoxical rhetoric that Paul is using here. I mean, It's interesting, some of the commentary I was reading on this uh, even says that Cicero mentions that the cross is basically taboo among the high social class, the Roman class. So this is like a translation, but a quote from Cicero. He says, the mere mention of the word cross is shameful to a Roman citizen and a free man. Yeah, see, there you go. And here's here's Paul. Yeah. Proudly proclaiming Christ crucified. Yeah. So he uses other terms that are like, paradoxical rhetoric to to highlight the divinity of his message you know he says things like god's foolishness or god's weakness right these might be seen as blasphemous but that's what paul is trying to to point out here is that these are are contrary to common wisdom but once people will delve into this and he gets later into the next chapter about being quote unquote mature right once people delve into this, they will realize that there is wisdom in this. It's just not the way that, that the Greeks think of wisdom, right? Indeed. At the very beginning of chapter two, Ben, we have Paul saying, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words of wis- or wisdom, right? So I decided nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, My speech and my proclamation were not plausible words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Which I think summarized says something like, this isn't about wisdom as you're used to receiving it. You know, in today's context, this isn't science, right? This Hmm. is mysticism, right? There's something here that, that science can't touch, right? That it has no access to. Which, by the way, I, you know, I, I think there's a confusion about what science can and can't do, right? Science doesn't have access to these things. That's a valid point still today. It just doesn't. Right? It's so, not asking those questions. It's, it's asking not, different right? questions. Yeah, exactly. The, the questions of science are only about what can, what is sense perceptible, right? What is measurable? It can be seen, heard, smelled, taste, touched. Love cannot be seen, heard, smelled, taste, touched. Neither can God. So what you have here is an experience. And we know that Paul has his own experience on the road to Damascus. And that's what starts him off on this whole ministry, right? We continue in verse six, yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What no eye hath seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. This was a verse that in the King James Version, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, what God has prepared for those who love him, was on my mother's bathroom mirror. And that's why I remember it so well. Yeah. Actually, I like the, yeah, that's a language that is familiar to me as well. I kind of like the the more poetic way that the King James puts it. 
Yeah, if I'm mem- if I'm memorizing a verse, I'm always memorizing either the original or the King James. If I'm studying NRSV, right? These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit? Now, this is interesting. This is really mystical stuff, mm-hmm. right? And I'm going to be talking about this on another podcast on saints and Sufis, right? So I'm not going to go d- too deeply into this, but we're talking about two different realms here, right? We're, we have the realm of the sense perceptible, as I've been mentioning, and then we have the realm of that which is above that, right? Which is not sense perceptible. And Paul is trying to take us from this realm to that realm. And, and that's what he's doing here with language. And language can't actually have access to that realm, but he's using the language to draw us into that realm, point to a more, yeah. yes, yeah. So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God, he says. So it's only the spiritual can only be comprehended by the spirit. And in verse 13, and we speak of these things in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. So they're, they're words that are describing a spiritual experience, interpreting spiritual things, he says, to those who are spiritual. Yeah, and you may only understand what they're saying if you've also had that experience or you seek that experience. Back in verse 6, when he uses the word mature, this is a, the Greek word that's translated as mature is indicating someone who's fully initiated into a community, like in a mystery cult, right? So already he's sort of evoking these mystery cult types of ideas within people's minds as they're starting to, to grasp what he's talking about here. So he's he's saying something like that the the wisdom of it comes to light as as you persist in that faith. So when as you were quoting Christopher reading the verses no eye has seen no heart conceived he talks about the depths of God you know no one comprehends except the spirit of God this is the mysterious the ineffable the depths of human consciousness and like you were saying, I, I think Paul here is waxing mis- mystical. <laughs> no, it really is. Yeah, it, it really is mystical. And in fact, let me back up again to back verse 11, right? You, you can't know these spiritual things except through your own spirit that is within, right? Because no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. What's implied there is that your spirit is the spirit of God. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Or has that close connection to it. It's what it's what is part of God or has the connection to God. Yeah. Exactly. That's Absolutely. that's maybe a better way to put it. Yeah. So the kingdom of God is within you. And so he's pointing us within. So to our innermost being, to our true self that has that is the one that is nearest to God, that has access to God. You know, and I think even within our tradition, there is a, a theological case to be made for the Holy Ghost actually being sort of a stand-in or reference to our own spirit, right? What's it within us? So I've heard that uh, expressed before, that it's, you know, not like some individual separate thing, but it's actually a stand-in for the spirit that's in us, that is that third part of God. Yes, indeed. That manifests God to us individually. Indeed, yes. So you mentioned that these things aren't found by those who do not seek, right? Seek and you shall find. So in verse 14, those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's spirit for they are foolishness to them. They're not interested in these things and they're unable to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. So notice how individual this is, right? It's You're not subject to anyone else's scrutiny when you are looking directly to the source right when you're when you're going within to your own soul which is closest to god it's not from books and no one can confirm or deny it from books right and then there's a quote for who has known the mind of the lord as to instruct him but we have the mind of christ so this is powerful stuff and mm-hmm. very mystical very it mystical is. yeah and i would go right into chapter three ben right yeah, and so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people. So I can't talk to you in these terms. I'm telling you there are these terms, but I can't talk to you in these terms, but rather as people of the flesh. As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, 
you're still not ready. So he's referring back to when he first visited them. One of the uh, features of these authentic letters of Paul is that they're sent to communities that were founded by Paul. And that's not the only way that we know whether they're authentic, but that is one of the features that they have in common, right? And so he says, I I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you're still not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? You know, that word that we have translated in an RSV as solid food, and in the King James it says meat, right? And I think within our modern uh, vernacular, meat typically indicates like the flesh of an animal. But, you know, in King James English, meat just kind of meant solid food, right? So it could mean anything. It didn't have to mean actually like animal flesh, right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, Bethlehem, right? The the, the city of David is uh, Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem. It's the house, yeah. of, the house of meat, literally, right? But it's known as the house of bread, right? Mm-hmm. Because bread is meat for men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we, we food. eat <laughs> food, bread. Yeah, exactly. In verse 13, continuing in this, in this mystical motif, right? And continuing in that kind of reading, I, I couldn't help but notice the fire will test what sort of work each has done. This is alchemical language, Ben, right? Fire used for testing. This is the, the forge, the crucible, right? The test. This is, this is what alchemists are doing. In verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, I wanted to point out in this verse, Ben, that this uh, you that we're dealing with here, that who are God's temple, is not a singular you. This is a plural you. This is y'all. Actually, yeah. y'all is singular in Texas. It's, it's all y'all. Okay? <laughs> it's all y'all. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy. And you, again, plural, all y'all are that temple. So it's the community of Christ that's the temple. And it's interesting, too, because we have a restored temple, right? That's part of the the idea of the restoration. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time that Paul is writing this, the temple is still there. And remember that the Jews here at this point are, are waiting for that presence of God to return, right? This is the anticipation uh, from antiquity, you know, what was ancient at that time, right, is is that at some point God's presence is supposed to return to this temple just like it did in the tabernacle in the wilderness, just like it did when the, you know, the temple of Solomon was was made, right? And so that is what has always been looked forward to kind of in a messianic way, but, but in terms of the temple. And so Paul is kind of saying here, okay, this anticipation. Now he's writing this to to Greeks, right? To Gentiles. So they they don't get all of this context. But I think within the mind of Paul, he's thinking all of this. He's just not he's not expounding all of this cultural context to them, which makes sense because they wouldn't really get it. But having yeah. gone through all the Old Testament, I can see how Paul is thinking here, right? In terms oh, yeah. of the temple. He's thinking, okay, I know that as a people we've been waiting for God's presence to be manifest in the temple. And this is, you know, maybe this is happens when the Messiah comes, right? Okay. So if Jesus is the Messiah, how is it that God's presence is manifest in the temple? We're not seeing that. And, and there is indications, especially in Acts that Paul still sees the temple as a holy place, but what he sees now more in terms of God's presence is that God now is present in the community. So now he sees, oh, the temple or the point of the temple was actually to point to the people as a whole being the actual, that's the real thing, right? The temple is the finger and the people is the moon that it's pointing at. The people where the community of the spirit of God actually lives and dwells. And so there's a sense that God's presence has returned to the temple, but it's not a temple made with hands. It's the temple of the community of the believers. Now we can compare this verse to a verse we find in chapter 6, so chapter uh, chapter 6, verse 19, which says a very similar thing about a person being God's temple, but then it's the singular then, right? And so there's a sense in which it's both the community and the individual that are temples of the Spirit of God. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's, it's 
it's the the people are the temple but of course what is the city but the people right Mm -hmm. so the the people as a whole are made up by individual persons right yeah in verse 18 ben we read do not deceive yourselves if you think that you are wise in this age you should become fools so that you may become wise right we've already dealt with the wisdom of men and the the wisdom of god and the difference so if you want to become wise in God, then you're going to become a fool in the world, right? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, and they are futile. So going into chapter four, Christopher, I I really I thought it was interesting that Paul says, starting in verse three, I do not even judge myself, right? So Paul, if we say the word judge here, I think that Paul the connotation is condemnation, right? He's exhorting them to not condemn others. And he's saying, I don't even condemn myself because it's not my place to condemn anybody. He says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment. And I would say condemnation, right? That kind of judgment, a condemnatory type of judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, he's the judge. Anything can happen before that, right? Like, (laughs) People can repent, people can change, people can be forgiven, sanctified, justified by Jesus. He goes into that kind of thing. And so all of this, he he gets into this later in judging in in chapter six, but this is a theme that he returns to about not condemning others because, well, in Romans, he develops it all under the concept of grace. And it doesn't seem to me that all of that concept, that understanding has coalesced yet within his mind. I mean, he's thinking along those lines, but he doesn't have all the same terminology for it that we see in Romans, because, I, th- you know, here we can kind of see the inkling of we're living under grace, right? And so we should not condemn others because God's grace is there for them. They just need to see it, right? Indeed, and this is a, a unifying concept or theme in this letter. If it is one letter, that would be the unifying theme. And I think we'll we'll come back to it, as you said, in chapter 6. And it's a unifying theme or concept in Paul, even if it does get this more mature expression, right, with, yeah. with grace and, and Romans, yeah. right, coming later. But it is already here. You can see it. In verse 7, Paul says, What do you have that you did not receive? This was reminiscent to me of King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon telling us not to turn away those who ask materially. We are all beggars, he says. You know, That's everything right. we have is a gift from God. And so we should seek opportunity or or try to not turn people away when, when they ask of us. Verses 12 and 13, Paul here is describing sort of his own condition and calling but uh, he's talking about apostles in general here. He says, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we speak kindly. So this is all, to me, echoes of the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus, right? To bless those who curse you, do good to those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Clearly. But then he goes on to say something really interesting. He says, we have become like the rubbish of the world, the dregs of all things to this very day. Now, I didn't think a whole lot of that until I saw some commentary um, on this because of those words rubbish and dregs. So apparently those words, rubbish and dregs, are the worst terms of abuse in Greek. And they were used to refer to the wretched of the populace, like the paupers and the deformed, who were those who were put to death for the purification of the city. Now, this is going to ring a bell with you, Christopher, I think, because when I read that, I was like, oh, that's Gerard, right? Where they bring the person in and they put them to death to purify the city. Yes, yeah, so you're referring to René Gerard, the yeah. the mimetic theory theorist. Mimetic violence, right? Right. Paul sees himself as one who is in some way emulating Jesus, right? In the sense that they are the rubbish, the dregs, those who are put to death for the purification of the city. In other words, you know, how Jesus was put to death for the purification of the people, or at least that's what it seemed to them that they were doing. They were doing this. They were putting their mimetic violence on him, and that was going to 
solve everything, right? That's going to solve the problem if we just kill this one guy. Yeah, that's very much in line with Gerard's theory. Going into chapter five, Ben, right at the beginning, we have a stated purpose for this letter. Maybe not the only stated uh, purpose for this letter, but a stated purpose for this letter. We read, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Now, if I just stop there, you think, and sometimes we do this when we're reading, it's sexual immorality in general. Well, maybe. And and we'll come back to that in chapter seven, right? But it's it, it reads comma and of a kind that is not found even among pagans. So we're talking about a particular kind of sexual immorality for a man is living with his father's wife. What we're talking about here is incest. And that what what's at issue here is that this one man in the community is committing incest and the community is not dealing with it appropriately, according to Paul. Yeah, their silence seems consent to him, right? Yeah. So what does he do with that? We have verse 5. You are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is a strange verse, Ben. It is. (laughs) Will you explain it to me? No, let me just say this first. (laughs) I remember sending you a message as we were studying. We, We send messages back and forth as we're preparing to podcast. I said, Ben, I have no idea what Paul's talking about. And I didn't mean in this verse. I meant in this week's reading. And and you came back and said, oh, darn, I was hoping you were were (laughs) going to explain it to me. I think we both got a better handle on on what's going on in these chapters than when we sent those messages back and forth. But I I thought you were just kidding. You know, (laughs) I wasn't kidding, Ben. So uh, there's there's a few things, I think, about this verse five. Uh, First off, you know, the commentary said it really wasn't clear. Uh, what exactly Paul is saying that they should do here. Like uh, maybe the implication is something that they understood. Like Paul is making some, some euphemistic reference and the people, okay. Oh, I know what you're talking about. This is what we should do, but it's not clear to us within our modern context, exactly what Paul is meaning here. It could be a reference to some sort of excommunication from the community, but I want to look at, the term Satan itself, because that's something, that's a theme, you know, that we've brought up multiple times and is important, I think, to our hermeneutic as well. And if we look at it this way, okay, you're handing this man over to, and we don't have an article here, but let's, let's say there is an article, okay, over to the Satan, right? So if you're handing someone over to the accuser, right, you're allowing their conscience but maybe maybe the bad part of the conscience, right? The accuser part <laughs> to act upon them, right? The idea, I guess the hope is there if you're if you're handing them over to that accuser, the hope is there that that person comes around, right? Recognizes yeah. the error of their ways and repents or or turns back and and changes their ways. Because what do we get at the very next part? of that verse so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Right. What's the purpose of this? The purpose isn't to condemn him. The purpose is to save him. That's right. Yeah. I want to put this in the context of Romans, right? If I'm looking ahead to Romans, which I can actually look back because I've already read it in the order I've read the text, right? Then I know where Paul ends up with this, right? This idea is going to be the whole point of pointing out the error, right? The whole point of the law is to show you, to remind you that there's grace. Mm -hmm. In the end, it's all about grace, right? So it's an act of mercy that we're dealing with here, not an act of condemnation, right? Once again, in in the spirit of the the whole letter, we're not dealing with condemnation. This is an anti-condemnatory message. Yeah. So I think it's something like you need to explain to him and tell him this is not okay that you're doing this. Right. So that then that quote unquote law can work on him to point him to grace. That's that seems kind of the mechanics of what Paul might be saying here in in the context of Romans. Right. (laughs) That reading tastes good to me, Ben. Now, in verse nine, we get this little clue that is often pointed to it. Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter and then, you know, talks about what he wrote in the letter. And the question is, okay, what letter? Because this isn't some other letter that we have to the Corinthians. Is this a lost letter uh, to the Corinthians? So this could be a lost letter if we, again, consider the theory that 1 Corinthians is a single unified letter. But 
if we consider that First Corinthians is actually something like three different letters, or maybe maybe he even wrote all the letters and sent them all together, right? Like I, I know back in the days of, of letter writing, people would sometimes write a letter to somebody and they didn't get around to sending it. And by the time they sent, you know, wrote another letter, they had two to send, right? And so they just sent them together kind of thing. So Paul, sure. there might be two letters going on here, but they were sent at the same time. So Paul could say, I wrote you in the other letter. Well, he says, I wrote you in another letter not to associate with sexually immoral persons. Well, he actually says that in here in 1 Corinthians. He talks about not associating with sexually immoral persons. And so he could be referring to what we would call the same letter, even if to Paul it was a different letter, right? I can see that, yeah. Now, what do you do with this, Ben? So he says, don't associate with these people. Do not even eat with such a one. I can't help but think of Jesus <laughs> eating with the people that, that Paul would say don't eat with. What, what do you do with this, Ben? What That's exactly that? where I was going with it. I, I, it does seem to contradict, at least maybe in principle, how Jesus associates with people. But it also kind of contradicts how Paul approached the question of circumcision in his arguments with the other apostles, right? It's just like, they're not obeying these certain things. And Paul's like, well, that that doesn't really matter, you know, like should still and then but then paul is telling them here don't associate with them now the the caveat to this is paul is saying only don't associate with the people who have already joined the community but are still indulging in these other uh, you know sinful things i guess you could say Uh, he doesn't use that word i see anyone who bears the name of brother or sister who is then also doing these? yeah exactly so he's he's saying oh it's oh it's okay if people haven't already agreed to your standards, right? What you want to do is avoid people who are hypocrites in in a certain sense, right? They've agreed to live by certain standards, but then they're not doing it. I'm still not comfortable with that, Ben. Well, I think that's might be what Paul is saying is what I'm saying. I don't know that, but I, I do agree that that does seem to contradict in principle, at least what Jesus says, and maybe even some of the other things that Paul says. Yeah, let's go into this a little bit. According to our hermeneutic, we're going to measure Paul against Jesus, not the other way around, right? <laughs> yeah. And so Jesus is going to eat with these people. Paul's not, right? That's that's the long and short of it. Um, you say maybe because these are insiders, not outsiders. Weren't the people Jesus was eating with insiders too? They're fellow Jews, right? Uh-huh. It's just that they are seen uh, according to the law. And according to the way the law is used, meaning used against people, which again, Paul himself is going to argue against, at least in Romans. And and I think even here in this very letter or one of these letters, if this is more than one letter. So I don't want to call, you know, I don't want to call interpolation, right? I didn't see that in any of the scholars, but it is curious. And I do think we have to read carefully and we have to read the text as a whole and see who is Paul, who is Jesus Right. And maybe bring that to this and either, I don't know what, if you set it aside or if you reinterpret it, um, we're constantly renegotiating the text anyway. And we have a hermeneutic. We have a way of reading the text. We have a lens through which we look at the text. Right. And oftentimes we don't know what that lens is. Ben, you and I have chosen Mm -hmm. intentionally our lens. Right. This is a a nonviolent Christ centric hermeneutic we're using. And that's why we raise these issues with these verses. I think another consideration with these verses is, remember, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he's giving them an instruction. That's right. And there's a lot about the context that we either have to assume or assume we don't know, right? Either one of those. And and one of the things we can assume we don't know is we don't know why exactly Paul is telling them this. Right. That's true. There could be some circumstances whereby this is appropriate to them, but it's not a general principled command. Right. That's a really good point. Like, you know, he says elsewhere in the letters, you know, this is a rule for all the churches. Oh, well, that that kind of begs the question. Right. Like, oh, are you saying that some of the things you're saying aren't rules for all the churches? Yeah, that seems to be what he's saying. Right. Some of the things he's telling Corinth are not rules that he would send to other people. Right. Yeah, I think that's clearly the case. You know, the, the, what he's saying here is for Corinth, and it's only when he says, there's one time that I can think of that he says, this thing that I'm saying is for all the churches. Mm-hmm. And this isn't that thing. So that's a good point. Chapter six starts talking about the followers of Christ and how they're to be the judges of the world. 
So there's a sense here in which those who have joined this community are part of an elite class and, and shouldn't lower themselves to the legal level of the rest of the people, right? Disputes shouldn't be taken to what what I would term, and you know, this is Ben Peterson's paraphrasing, right? <laughs> Disputes shouldn't be taken to the lower courts, so to speak. They should be handled internally. Why is that? Well, because you are a people who are sort of of a higher class, so to speak. You've joined this community or followers of Christ. If you take your disputes to other courts, then you're allowing yourselves to be judged by a lower standard. What you want is to be judged by the higher standard. Sure. Sure. And I love how in verse seven, he says, in fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Now let's go further, right? Why not rather be wronged? You're supposed to turn, turn the other cheek, right? Yeah. Why not rather be defrauded? Turn the other cheek. But you yourselves wrong and defraud and believers at that, right? So, so again, the same theme with Paul that we saw in Romans that you, as soon as you say, oh, I'm going to bring this suit against you because you wronged me, you're a hypocrite, right? Because you've, you do wrong, you've wronged others. And, and you're doing it to believers, you know, you're doing it to the, the insiders in your community. This is hypocrisy. Yeah, and this seems to echo uh, what I see in the Gospels as well, uh, Jesus talking about, you know, if you have something against your brother, you know, you reconcile yourselves before you go to court, right, kind of thing. That's right. So, now, uh, you know, the next verses, 9 and 10, these verses, uh, Christopher, we spoke before recording, we talked for about two hours about these verses. <laughs> About these two verses. Just yes, these that's two right. verses. An hour per verse. Yeah. And and if if these verses are set in the right context textually, right? Like verses seven and eight, Paul really did write or dictate just before verse nine. I think there's some um, interesting things to be said about verse nine that I hadn't heard before from anybody else. So there's a lot to say about verses nine and 10. And we won't be able to say it all. Yeah, we're not going to be able to say it all. But one of the first points that I want to make about it is that when Paul makes this list of wrongdoers and and all of the things that indicate they're wrongdoers, this is in the context of not judging others, right? Not condemning others, as I was saying before. So, so, So in other words, you shouldn't condemn even people who do this, 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 and this? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to condemn those people. God's going to take care of it. He's the judge. Remember, he says in the next verses, you were doing, many of you were doing these things and you were forgiven. You were washed clean. You were converted. You were justified. So you shouldn't condemn others who at any point could turn away, could repent of these things. They have the same chance, right? You have to, you have to give the grace. You have to allow that grace to exist. And again, I'm seeing sort of like the buds, the the proto concepts of the grace and law here within Paul's writing, and then that becomes much more fully developed as far as, far as his rhetoric and terminology within Romans. But you can see it kind of starting here. These these ideas. It's actually kind of nice that we got to have Romans first, right? Mm. Yeah, it's like those movies where you see the end first, and then it's like, okay, this is how we got here. And then he goes, yeah. <laughs> the very the very next verse then continues in the same list, and I think we have to read it this way, right? It's the same list, yeah. and it's not sexual immorality, and there doesn't seem to be a hierarchy here, right? right? Paul didn't split the verses. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's just the same list, and, and yeah, it's, it's things are sort of grouped together. But I don't see a hierarchy. Do you see a hierarchy? No. It just seems like one list of these are all the things. Yeah, I don't see a hierarchy. These are are things. It, remember, he's talking about being wronged by someone and not taking them to court or not disputing with them, turning the other cheek, right? So all of these things are things where someone is wronging someone else. And we look at verse 9 as this list of sexual immorality things. But it's not just that, right? It's about being wronged. And so then we get that other list, right? Which are, is really part of the same list. Uh, we've got it divided up into two verses, but Paul didn't put the verse numbers in there, right? And so how we read, particularly verse nine, 
and all of Paul's commentary on sexuality will largely depend on our own views of sexuality. But it's important to remember that Paul is commenting within the context of an ancient view of sexuality, not our modern views. And that ancient view of sexuality is quite different than you might expect. And we spent a lot of time looking into it, and we don't even find that the scholars agree, not on what the sexual uh, mores are, but on how to interpret what Paul is saying about them. They do seem to agree that it's difficult. (laughs) Yes, and we agree with them. It is difficult. Yeah. And so even the words that we have in front of us in verse 9, whether we're looking at KJV or NRSV, are very controversial, to say the least. Uh huh. One of these terms is even a term that it's not it's not found in other texts. Right? It's not found anywhere else in the Bible. It's not found in what we call surrounding texts. Right? Other texts from the time and place. It may be because it is actually a vulgar word or slang. Yeah. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. So it's not really the kind of word that you would find in this kind of text. Right. With this kind of rhetoric. So that begs a question of why is Paul using this word, right? But again, these words are not clear in their meaning. They're variously translated. All translations given are interpretations, and the interpretations are often based on a context that is not the context in which the text is written, but in another context, whether it's the medieval context or our our context, right? Or anywhere in between or or between... uh, the Middle Ages and Paul's time for that matter. And that's what we see, right? As, as we looked at uh, commentary and translations down through the ages, it, they really seem to reflect more the sexual mores of the time in which the translation and commentaries are made rather than Paul's. And so with that, it's actually hard to tell what Paul is saying. You know, what is his opinion vis-a-vis mm-hmm. the, the mores of his time? He may be a social reformer with a completely different opinion. He may be okay with some of the things that that we wouldn't be okay with. So one of the ways in which you can wrong someone, if we take adultery, for example, in his time, again, without saying whether or not Paul would agree with this, we can't really say. But in his time, if a man has sexual relations with a woman who is not his wife and is also not someone else's wife, that's not adultery. So he has a wife. And he's having sexual relations with another woman. As long as that woman is not someone else's wife, it's not adultery. It's adultery if she's married to someone else. Because he's wronging the owner of that property. That woman was considered property in his time and place of another man. According to the Greco-Roman conceptualization that's of, right. of sexual relations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's just one example. It's complicated. So we have to be careful because... If we misread this, right, if we're if we're trying to shoehorn this verse into our own sexual mores, then we run the risk of doing violence to the text and violence to our fellow human beings. And this isn't just theoretical. This has been done. Yeah. Right? The violence to human beings has followed the violence to the text. And we have to avoid that at all costs. And I think if we take the overall message of Paul, it's not our place. It's yeah. not for us to judge. That's God's place. Ben, we mentioned earlier that we're going to come to another verse about the the body as a temple, right? And we talked about how it it will be uh, singular this time. It was plural last time. But I said, what is the city but the people, right? As Shakespeare puts it. So the the individual persons make up the people who are the temple. But I want to relate that to verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So Again, the community of Christ is where Christ dwells, as you said, Ben, in the whole community. That means that each person in that community is one of the members of the body of Christ, per verse 15. You know, that reminds me, Christopher, (laughs) we've talked about the word remember, right? So you said our bodies are members of the body of Christ. Yes. And we use this word remember, especially in the sacrament prayers, which I think is you know, important to this context, because there we have the symbolic body of Christ that is being broken up into different pieces, distributed among the community of followers of Christ, which are his body, right? 
And we're told in the prayer that we will remember. And remember is mostly used in our language to indicate a mental exercise. And that's certainly part of it, right? Like there's certainly mental exercising going on when we are having sort of a a, a ritualistic experience with the sacrament, right? But it's symbolically so much more than that. Right. It's There's a mental exercise that we call remembering because we're harking back to mm-hmm. the sacrifice, the, the breaking of the body of Christ in a literal sense. Now we're having this breaking of a bread that's symbolizing the body. And now what? Yeah. So remembering is bringing those pieces back together into the body of Christ. Anything that has been separated or divided, as we talked about way back in chapter one. <laughs> dismembered. Yeah. Dismembered or parted out into the different parts, it's now going to be remembered and brought back together as a whole, which is symbolically uh, represented within the cup, right? The blood of Christ, which everybody takes as the same. That's the unifying symbolism that's happening there, that remembering. That's right. That's not how we do it, of course, but that's no. That's but how it, it, was it could be how people do it as a mental exercise when they take the sacrament, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Beautiful. That brings us to chapter seven, Ben. Yeah. Chapter seven. Don't touch women, Christopher. Okay. Okay. That's (laughs) what Paul thinks, right? I shouldn't touch women. You know, it's interesting because if we read King James, it's, I think it's easy to get the impression that Paul is saying that it is well for a man not to touch a woman. I'm reading from NRSV, Uh, but in NRSV, I have quote marks. Yes. Let me read the whole verse. (laughs) Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, colon, open quote, It is well for a man not to touch a woman. You see, he's referencing something they said, and now he's going to respond to it. It's not that this is what he's saying. Yeah. We have this in social media where you reply to a comment, right? That's right. I see that. But (laughs) but here in these ancient letters where there's no punctuation or anything, it's hard. So I think it's easier to see what's going on here in the NRSV, but it's not that you can't see it in KJV once you've seen it, right? I don't think it's controversial. It's clear, I think, that Paul is saying, I'm responding to what you said. I'm not saying this. So what is he saying, Ben? Yeah, so, and this phrase, not to touch a woman, is a euphemism for sexual relations. He's not talking about actually touching people, right? This is, oh, okay, this is thank goodness. Not even controversial interpretation. Because there, there go all the waiter's tips, you know, if, yeah. they, if they can't <laughs> touch the people on the forearm. Forearm is okay, right? Yeah. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a set time, we read in verse 5, to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again. Now, this verse in the King James Version includes fasting. And I have a point to make about fasting. And I'm reading in NRSV, studying in NRSV, and it's not there. And so I say, well, okay, uh, I can still make my point because, but the question you brought up, Ben, is, well, is it in the Greek? And it's not. It's not. <laughs> but but you're like, it should be. But I'm still going to make my point, Ben. I'm still going to make my point because I think, you know, it's in the spirit of the thing, right? So here's the thing I was thinking, Ben. I think for many, fasting just means I think Latter-day Saints are going to start their fast with a prayer and they're going to end their fast with a prayer. I'm, I'm starting my fast. Give a prayer, right? I'm ending my fast. This is a signal to themselves and to God that they're starting and ending their fast. But I'm not sure that everyone's praying the whole time they're fasting. So for me, they're just going hungry. This is what I teach my kids. Mm-hmm. If you're not praying, Dad, I'm hungry. I'm having a hard time with this fasting thing. Well, are you praying? Are you just looking at the clock and waiting for it to be time to eat? You see what I mean? Yeah. I, I ride my bike usually every day, you know, so, something like 30 minutes to an hour. I'm really trying to do it for an hour every day. My chiropractor wants me to do this. And I found that it's harder the second half hour. And if I'm looking at my watch, it's even harder, right? If I get on the phone and talk to somebody, the, the half hour flies by. So this is a good analogy, right? If I'm just looking at my watch, what time am I going to get to eat versus pray to God? So if you're praying and you're fasting, I think uh, it makes sense, right, to, to you're having this ascetic experience. So to me, the fasting fits in, right? And so it makes sense to me that if you are having an ascetic experience, that you would probably set aside sexual relations during that time too. You're going to set aside food, drink, sexual relations, because you're fasting. But if you're not fasting, as it turns out, you're not fasting here in the, in the Greek, well, then maybe this is irrelevant. But I say if you are <laughs> fasting, there's something to think about. 
Well, and I've heard fasting talked about in in different contexts other than food, too. You know, people will go on social media fast, they'll do their things. And I think that's actually a really healthy way of looking at it, that fasting as a broader principle could be used um, in a healthy way for people. It's about intention, right? So like I was thinking of this analogy or, or parallel to this. If I'm listening to an audiobook, but I'm thinking about something else, right? My ears hear it right? Like it's going in my ears, but it's, I'm not processing and I'm not engaged in that audiobook because I'm thinking about something else, right? So there's not the intention there in that. So I didn't get anything out of it. And that's kind of like fasting without there being intention in the fasting or fasting without prayer kind of. Yeah. And I don't just mean opening and closing prayer. I mean, praying throughout. Sure. Yeah. Verse 7, like verse 1, is really important to understanding Paul in this letter. And, and that's because he says, I wish that all were as I myself am. But, but, each has a particular gift from God, one having one kind and another a different kind. Now, what is the point of this? At this point, who knows, right? Maybe you don't realize what the point of this is. But later on, Ben, when he says, this is what I think. You have to remember this verse and remember that he said, hey, it'd be great if everybody thought like me, but God has made them to think for themselves. And so I don't think we can take everything that's Paul's opinion as a prescription. And I think Mm -hmm. he himself is letting us know this in verse seven. Agreed. So we'll see where that comes into play. Well, maybe by verse eight, right? Yeah. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm able to stay celibate as a gift from God, but I recognize that not everybody has that gift and it's okay. Yeah. But, but... It's better to marry than to burn in hell, right, Christopher? That's right. You don't want to burn in hell for for fornicating, (laughs) right? Yeah, this is uh, this is probably an unfortunate translation, the King James version, because the the implication might be that yeah, we're talking about some eternal punishment going on here, but actually the burning is is a, a passion. So the NRSV gets this better. It says, you know, it's better to marry than to be aflame with passion, right? Or the, the idea here being that you're so distracted with this temptation, with this passion, that it consumes your life because you're not able to actually have the relationship that you want, right? So it's better to go ahead and be married and be in that committed relationship to have that, that experience than it is for you to be constantly distracted in your life by this temptation. Yes. That advice, along with the advice in verses 32 through 34 jumping ahead, that say, you know, if you have a spouse, it's going to be a distraction from God. There's a sense in which that makes sense, right? It's, if, I, if I don't have a spouse and I'm going to focus on God, I don't, I'm not going to have to divide my focus between God and my spouse, right? So those two pieces of advice, I find them familiar because they show up again later in a Sufi uh, mystic text which is the alchemy of happiness, right? This is from Al-Ghazali, died 1111. And I think Paul and Al-Ghazali have something in common here. They're both mystics, right? They're both mystic. They're actually both mystics and theologians, right? They're philosopher, theologians, and mystics. And they have a good point to make, but that doesn't mean that these are prescriptions. And that's how they were taken, right? You end up with monasticism in, in the church because of this until the Protestant Reformation, with some exceptions, right, in in, uh, Eastern Christianity, where, by the way, it was acceptable to be um, a priest and be married if you were already married before you became a priest. Hmm. And that reminds me of the context of this letter, in which Paul doesn't seem so much concerned, uh, as we might think he might be, with the sexual mores per se, you know, in and of themselves, but rather, or, or with who does what to whom, right? But rather that things sort of stay the same. And and it's, again, in a context in which the end is nigh. Peaceful relations between people, right? You know, the the context of that verse we were talking about is being wronged and, and forgiving. Right. And so it's about maintaining peaceful relations between people. And also, you know, he says in verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties, right? So we're trying to remove things from your life and your relationships that cause you anxiety and are distractions from your, from your discipleship of Jesus. Right. Especially when the end is near, you know, and 
what difference would it make whether you if okay so you don't get married the the end is near right just yeah. focus on that i think some of those prescriptions if they're even prescriptions we're, we're saying they're not prescriptions right that's right. what we're saying here according to verse 7 but even if they were i don't think they apply in our context and i think we understand that it's a lot easier to say you know okay jesus is coming soon don't bother getting married sell everything you own or give it away to the you know i think it's easier to do that when the end is near yeah and maybe that's a challenge for us uh you know we say the end is near still uh, and maybe and it is right i mean the end is near for each of us are we prepared are we prepared to die and no man knoweth you know we don't know when christ is coming again so i think th- there's a sense in which we can apply this to ourselves but i don't know that we can take what we're reading here as prescriptions yeah. what do you think ben well, I, there are some things about divorce that, you know, have negotiated by people in different ways, just as there are about marriage, right? So, Oh, sure. And the sexual mores too. Yeah. And, and Paul is decidedly against divorce, even if he's, you know, only marginally more so than he is against marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And so that's held on to, right, by the Catholic Church. You cannot divorce. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these other um, mores that are from Paul's time, again, we don't know how he felt about them necessarily, but they have been uh, taken as prescriptive on the one hand and yet renegotiated on the other. And yet some of the ones that we agree with that we like to use to bash other people, we hold on to those. Mm -hmm. The ones that we don't agree with that we don't want to apply to us, we renegotiate. And I think that's contrary to the spirit of this letter and to all of Paul's writings, especially as we see them in their fullest maturation in Romans, right? It's when we're judging others, we're condemning ourselves. Yeah. I have something I want to talk about here in verses 12 through 17, Ben. In verses 12 through 17, we get that Paul is telling us, if a woman is married to a man who's not a believer and he wants to stay married to her, she should stay married to him. And who knows, that? She, but she might become his salvation. And the other way around, the inverse applies too, right? If a man is married to a woman who's not a believer and she wants to stay married to him, then he should stay married to her. And who knows that he might, what, he might become her salvation, right? And yet, if the spouse wants to leave, then the spouse should be allowed to leave in peace. Because that, as you pointed out, Ben, that's the key here, right? Is to be at peace, right? Not to make a big to do, mm-hmm. but to let people, again, it would be nice if everybody agreed with me, as Paul said, I think we can all say this, Ben, can't we say this? It wouldn't it be nice if everybody agreed with me, but <laughs> yeah. they don't, right? Yeah. They don't. <laughs> and so we have to, as it says in verse 17, let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned to which God called you This is my rule, and this is important because this is my rule in all the churches. So he is giving a clear prescription here. He's saying, so this is my rule. And it applies not only to the Corinthians, but to all the churches. And that's because this is key, core, peaceful principles. And the principles are peace and agency, right? Yeah, seems so. When we've talked about circumcision in Romans, the works of the law sort of equaling circumcision, or at least what's the little squiggly line, equal sign, something like that, right? Hmm. Congruent to, yeah. Congruent to, yeah. So here we have circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But obeying the commandments of God is everything. Ben, you said in pre-show discussion that sounded like a contradiction, right? It does. uh, Possibly, you know, somebody might look at this and be like, isn't circumcision a commandment, right? Right, right. But the fact is... I think what Paul is saying is circumcision was a sign. I mean, God could have said, you know, grow a long pinky nail. Yeah. Right. There you go. Or, yeah, because don't we have, you know, some people, they don't cut their hair, right? The Sikhs, mm-hmm. they don't cut their hair. That's a sign, too, of devotion. And so it's not so much that circumcision is a thing. It's obedience that matters. Mm. And so the wider context is, okay, if you're a Gentile and you're becoming a follower of Jesus, you don't have to be circumcised. If you're a Jew, then you should be circumcised. And if you're already circumcised, well, then stay circumcised. 
I don't know how you would do otherwise, <laughs> but but if you're not circumcised, don't get circumcised. And so his same thing. He's saying if you're already married, stay married. If you're not married, maybe don't get married. Right? That that in his in this context, right? Yeah. We've already covered that. Yeah. Yeah. I was a little surprised in verse 25 to see Paul here say, "I, I don't have a command of the Lord, but I give my opinion." Right. Yes. I I just thought it was uh, pretty interesting to see. Someone in scripture, right? What we call scripture explicitly saying, this is my opinion. Now there is only one other example I can think of this. And it's in the book of Alma when he's talking to his son and he's explaining about the resurrection. And he says, I don't know. I haven't received revelation on this, but I give it as my opinion. And then he explains this thing, right? The thing that Paul gives us his opinion here in verse 26 is he says, in view of the impending crisis. What's this impending crisis? Well, this is what you you were talking about, Christopher, at the very beginning. This is, again, the anticipation of Jesus coming back very soon. And so he says in verse 29, the appointed time has grown short. And so as, as we were talking about here, all the things that Paul is trying to explain are trying to remove the anxieties from people, right? I think when I read this, I thought, oh, Paul's a minimalist. (laughs) What do you mean, Ben? He wants to reduce the complexities of your life so that you can just focus on your discipleship. And, you know, in some context, that might be a minimalist type of view. Oh, essentialism, right? There's a book called Essentialism by a Latter-day Saint author, right? Greg McCown? Hmm. Yeah. I get that. So he wants to focus all on being prepared to, for the return of Jesus. So even familiar relations for Paul can be a distraction. So you rid yourselves of those anxieties. Keep it simple. That's it. I'm just going to go let my wife know. I just want to keep it simple, honey. <laughs> well, Ben, that's all I've got. So that is 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 7. We have the remaining chapters of 1 Corinthians to cover next week. Uh, Some of the similar themes that we'll get into with those. I'm looking forward to chapter 13. So another shout out to all those who participated in the Latter-day Peace Studies Project. And a big thanks to those who help us out. Kyle for editing and Des and Bethany and Laura, you, Christopher and Riley. Appreciate everything you do. And you, Ben. This Latter-day Peace Studies is an all-volunteer operation. And nonprofit. Latter-day Peace Studies is a nonprofit 501c3 corporation. Did I say that right? Yes. Uh, your donations are tax deductible. We don't have a lot of expenses, but maybe we should. We, we're, we need editors, right? Podcast editors. <laughs> we have some other ideas. You know, if you, if you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to hear more, please consider donating. How's that done, Ben? Yeah, so people can donate through PayPal. If they go to our website, latterdaypeacestudies.org, and click on get involved. There's a donate link on there for PayPal. If they don't use PayPal and they want to donate in another way, please reach out to us. You can email us, studies at gmail.com. You can reach us on Facebook through our page or through our group or through any private message. You could message me, Ben Peterson. You could message Riley Risto. You could message Christopher Hurtado. Yeah, thanks for all your comments, by the way. It's nice to hear from you. Have a good week, everybody. 